Lifting Up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. Tonight we'll be looking at the great church robbery, but first let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you with prayerful, thankful hearts. As always, Lord God, we trust you by your spirit to illuminate your word to us. And we ask, Lord God, as always, for the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also, in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Before we look to the great church robbery, can I just take a few minutes and look at 1 Corinthians, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter, on a separate note. The epistles are the easiest literary genre in scripture to interpret because the meanings are straightforward. If there's anything typological or midrashic or complicated, it explains it. If you have literary symbolism, it says what it is, with the exception of Jude, where Jude assumed from the people's culture and background they knew what he was talking about when he used a symbolic meaning. The epistles are inspired commentary. We read the rest of scripture through the prism of the epistles. If you want to know what the book of Leviticus is about, read Hebrews. If you want to understand the Gospels, read Romans. Epistles explain the rest of scripture. If you want to understand what Jesus meant in the Olivet Discourse about the last days, read 2 Thessalonians. Scripture explains, uh, epistles explain the rest of scripture on the most simple, straightforward level. Let's look at this chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. I've explained before how the high priest would go into the Kidron on the first day of the week of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But then he continues in the following verse. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits after that, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers up to the kingdom, the kingdom to the Father, God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. He must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Death is actually an enemy and it will be abolished. Um, in Adam all die. The notion that Jesus is a descendant of Adam is absolutely heretical. If all die in Adam, how could Christ give life if he had the sin of Adam? Jesus is called the last Adam. Both Adam and Jesus were physically created directly by the hand of God. Now Jesus, of course, pre-existed spiritually. But the scriptures say, prepare thou a body for me. The body of Adam and the body of Jesus were made by God directly. They were not procreated, okay? There's only two generic men in God's economy. When somebody's born, they're born of Adam. When somebody's born again, they're born of, of Christ. That's it. The idea that Christ could, could be, come from Adam is absolutely undermining to the... First of all, it's, it's blasphemous because it would mean Jesus had sin, but secondly, it would mean he could not save us. In Adam all die. Why? Well, God gave the law to Israel that through Israel and the Jews, he would demonstrate the human condition, that because of the sin of Adam, we have a fallen nature and we cannot keep God's commandment. This was denied by heretics in the early church. The chief one was known as Pelagius. Pelagius. It was revived in the 19th century by somebody called Charles Finney. Although he didn't call himself a Pelagian, he virtually believed the same thing, just stopping short of what Pelagia said. Um, there's two errors. One is the error of extreme Calvinism, which says God creates certain people to go to hell and certain to go to heaven. And that faith 
follows regeneration. In other words, God regenerates you, makes you born again, then you get faith. This is crazy. God convicts you and gives you the faith to be born again and you accept Jesus. That's what the scripture teaches. That error is extreme Calvinism. The opposite error is this Pelagianism. Throughout the centuries, the Christian church has been very apt at, create, at, at correcting error with error. And we see it today. People create, uh, co try to correct error with error. There were people in the early church, for instance, who were denying the deity of Christ. Now, it's impossible to overstate the deity of Christ. God is God. You can't overstate his deity. But what you can do is understate his humanity. <laughs> so there were people who came along named Docetists who said when he walked on the beach, he didn't leave footprints in the sand. He only looked... They, cr they corrected error with error. They corrected error with error. Same today. We have charismaniacs and hyper-Pentecostals swinging on the chandeliers practicing the occult and even new age types of beliefs thinking it's biblical charismata and so then you'd have cessationists, people like John MacArthur would react against that they tried to correct error with error the church has always had this problem, correcting error with error you don't correct error with error, you correct error with truth now I accept the errors of extreme Calvinism but you don't correct it with the other error of Pelagianism I know there were some people in this church, I'm sad to say, people I knew that recently had gone into this idea of Pelagianism. It is absolutely, categorically heretical. Jesus did not come from Adam. He was pre-existent and he was physically created directly by the Father. Secondly, all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God, not simply because of their own choice, but also because of their own nature. We have a fallen nature. The scriptures teach us we were born fallen, therefore we must be born again. Now some have tried to say this would make God unjust. Philosophically, they could make that argument, I suppose, if God did not make a provision for the fact we were born in sin. But God did make a provision. He did make a way of salvation. He did make a way of escape. Now there's much more to this than we have time to go into tonight. While Adam and Eve literally existed, they are also symbols of us. In other words, if God created Jacob and Pavia, or if God created Bill and Chris, or if God created any two of us, we would have done the same things, Adam, and I have no doubt that any, any other couple would have done the same things they did. I have no doubt that that is true. I'm not trying to suggest otherwise. I have no doubt that that's true. But the fact is, it's also true that in Adam all die, in Christ all who accept Christ shall live. I'm sorry that this happened in this church, and the people who are into this have gone into very, very serious error. It's not just an opinion. It, it undermines the gospel. It undermines the very gospel, the nature of salvation itself. If, it, 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 we need a new nature. If the old one wasn't fallen, you wouldn't need a new one. It's as simple as that. Now, if anyone wants to talk to me about it, I'd be happy to. If you've been troubled by anything you may have heard, but these people, may God bless them, may God correct them, but they've gone into a fundamental error. That's all I'm going to say because that's all I think it's appropriate for me to say tonight, but such is it. I'd be happy to talk to anybody personally who's troubled about these issues with the pastor's consent. He said, I, I can address this. Look with me, please. Now to tonight's subject, the great church robbery. The great church robbery. Turn with me to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, please. The Gospel of St. John, chapter 6. Two Greek words tonight, well, more than two, but two main ones, kleptos, it's the primary New Testament word for thief, kleptos, kleptos.
Harpezo is what a kleptos does. <laughs> to seize a way by force. To rip off. Harpezo is to rip something off and the kleptos is the one who does this. We get the word kleptomaniac. Kleptomaniac, okay? Now just to be absolutely accurate, some people try to tell us the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, the word rapture is in the Bible. It comes from the Latin Vulgate. It simply is the Latin translation of harpezo. Our word rapture simply comes from the Latinization of harpezo. The word rapture is most certainly in Scripture. However, it is in Scripture at more than one place. What they want to do this evening is to look at every place it occurs in the New Testament. Because every place that word occurs in the New Testament teaches something about the rapture. Every time, in every place, in every context, that word harpezo occurs in the New Testament, it teaches something about the rapture. But, but let's just go just a little bit further. Harpezo plus anesthesia equals Episuna Gage, whoops. Episuna Gage. The catching away plus resurrection. equals our gathering together to him. The Greek word epi, a prefix meaning around. So in other words, the rapture and resurrection are simultaneous. They are two aspects of the same event, the return of Jesus. Okay? That's called the epi sunagage. Okay? The episunagage is functionally the same, functionally the same as parousia, the revelation of Jesus Christ that's coming, okay? Not revelation in the sense of apocalypse, but the revelation of the true believers, okay? okay. Apocalypse is a different word for revelation. Apocalypse is a word for revelation that means unveiling. This will not be an unveiling. It'll be psh, every eye shall see ultimately. Okay, but we're mainly concerned with kleptos and harpezo. I have a friend in England who is a computer software engineer. Nice guy with a young family. He fit into a church like this if he wasn't English. And he and his wife, uh, he's an elder in a church near Stonehenge in England, near Stonehenge where I speak once or twice a year. And he runs his own business. And he has an interesting line of work. He's a computer consultant, but he's hired by banks and by credit card companies and by corporations and sometimes by government agencies, although he doesn't talk about that much, to hack into computer systems. He's actually hired to hack into computer systems and to steal highly confidential information, usually of a financial nature. And he tells me that it's Chinese triads and Russian mafia are the most dangerous computer thieves because the Russian mafia are not like American gangsters. They're usually ex-KGB agents from the old Soviet empire and they have master's degrees and PhDs, they're multilingual and many of them have degrees in computer science or else they will hire people who do have degrees in computer science 
to do the hacking for them. The Chinese triads will be the same. They'll actually hire software engineers or computer engineers to do the hacking. And he said this is a growing problem and it's a, therefore he has a growing industry and a growing business. He does the same thing a thief does. He does the same thing a thief does. He hacks in and he steals the information. When he gets the contract, he, the people in the company don't know he's going to do it, only the senior management knows it. He doesn't tell them when he's going to do it. He doesn't tell them how he's going to do it. And he'll do it by remote. If he was trying to hack into a computer in, in England, he, he, he'd do it via Hong Kong, or he would do it via Mumbai or something like that, where they wouldn't even be able to trace it to him. He would do the same kind of things professional hackers would do, that they wouldn't even be able to trace, trace it very easily. He does the same thing. What he's trying to do is steal that information before a real thief, before a real thief does on the supposition that if he did it, they can do it. Therefore, he's going to do, find out how to do it before they will. He comes, as it were, he comes to rob the thief. That's his job, that's his livelihood. He's a Christian, he's never stolen as much as a paperclip. But he does the same thing a thief does. He's actually hired to break in, not just the computer systems, but the secure systems. That's what he does. With this in view, look with me please, to John chapter 6, verse 15. Jesus therefore, perceiving that they were intending to come and harpezo him, coming to rapture him, to snatch him away by force. Same word. Jesus perceived that they were coming to rapture him in verse 15 of John 6. To make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Notice he was aware the rapture was coming. <laughs> Notice he was aware the rapture was coming. That same Jesus will make us aware the rapture is coming. Every time you see that word, it teaches something about the coming rapture. The beginning, he knew it was going to happen before it happened. Now we won't know the day or the hour, but we know it's getting closer. Yeah. And we will know what action to take. Now of course they were coming to try to forcibly make him king. His kingdom was not of this world. That was not his purpose in his first coming. It's his purpose in his second coming. He did not allow himself to be raptured and made king. He will come back himself and make him self king when he returns. In other words, they wanted to rapture him. No, he's coming to rapture us. You understand? <coughs> they thought they, we thought, people thought we could rapture him. No, he's coming to rapture us and make him king. It's going to be the opposite. But he knew it was going to happen. Now, here it occurs in the future passive. It's harpezomai, but it's the same word. Let's look, please, to John chapter 10, verses 10 to 12. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Kill is stuza, destroy is apolezo. We get the word apolion. The thief comes only to steal, to kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. Okay, that's what he says. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. He who is a hireling and not a shepherd who was not the owner of the sheep, beholds the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf harpezos them and scatters them. The wolf harpezos them. The wolf raptures them. That's what it says. The wolf raptures them. I go back to my friend in England. His job is to rob the thief. His job is to steal the information before the real before the thief steals the information he does the same thing the thief does satan comes to harpezo to rapture to snatch away by force now let's look at john chapter 10 a bit further verses 28 and 29 
I give eternal life to them, they shall never perish. No one shall harpazo them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to harpazo them out of the Father's hand. The only thing that's saying is, if we are in the hand of Christ, Satan cannot snatch us away from him. He cannot touch the new creation. If we are in the hand of Christ, he cannot snatch us out. That's all. You can't be snatched away. This does not address the issue of backsliding. People have taken it out of context and given it a meaning that is not warranted in the context. It does not say someone cannot get out of the hand. It simply says they cannot be snatched out of the hand. It has nothing whatsoever to do with a person themselves choosing not to be in the hand of Christ. It simply says if someone chooses to be in the hand of Christ, they cannot be snatched away. Now understand again, unsaved people do not have a free will. Their will is in bondage. They cannot choose Christ unless they are convicted by the Holy Spirit. They have to be empowered and convicted to choose Christ. It requires divine intervention for them to be saved. Nobody comes unless the Father draws him. In our salvation, we get back our free will. You understand? Yes. Now Calvinism denies this. We get back our free will when we come to Christ. He empowers us to be able to make that choice we couldn't make had he not so empowered us. Free will is restored at the cross. Free will is something that gets back. It makes us possible to choose Christ and to remain in Christ. This has nothing whatsoever to do with backsliding or the will of the individual. It only says that the thief can't do it. The verse has been misapplied very often. Now let's look, please, at Matthew chapter 13, verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown next to the road. Somebody hears the gospel, they get convicted, they think about getting saved. Well, no one can snatch them out of the Lord's hand, but if they haven't gone that far yet, <laughs> the seed has not fallen to the earth and died, you know what's going to happen. The devil is going to try to snatch it away. He's going to try to take it away. That's how he operates. But now let's look at Matthew 24, 43. You witness to somebody, you tell them the gospel, they believe it, they say they'll come to church on Sunday, but the next day, Jehovah's Witnesses knock on the door. Well, the devil sent them there. That's the devil coming to snatch away what was sown. But in Matthew 24, let's look at this in verse 43, please. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. He's coming like a thief in the night. In other words, he robs the thief. Jesus comes in the character of the devil. He comes in the character of the devil. He snatches us away before the enemy does. He comes in the character of the devil. It's the master gambit. He beats the devil at his own game. The devil is a kleptos. Jesus is not a kleptos, but he comes like a kleptos and does the same thing the kleptos does. In other words, to understand the nature of the rapture, we have to understand the nature of the devil. The Lord comes to rob the thief. Okay. Now let's look at this idea of the kleptos, who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. How the devil does this, and how it manifests itself. Everybody gets robbed. The question is, who's going to do it? 
You're either going to be harpezoed by the kleptos, or you're going to be harpezoed by the one who is like a kleptos. Look with me, please, to Psalm 50, verse 18. The Hebrew word is ganav. Here in the Psalm of Asaph, the leadership of the nation was being castigated. And they're told, when you see a thief, you are pleased with him. You associate with adulterers. Notice the relationship between impropriety and immorality. And so often when you see these ministers fall from grace. It's spiritual pride, it's financial impropriety, and sexual immorality. It's usually one of those three things, and in some cases they hit the jackpot. Well, frequently they hit the jackpot. The same guys fooling around with women are very often the same ones who are preaching word faith or have their fingers in the cookie jar or whatever. When you see a thief, you are pleased with him. You associate with adulterers. Well, what's happening now? Just look at this. This is not a new problem. This was around in ancient Israel. Now, I'm only telling you what's in the public domain. That guy, the tattooed guy, Todd Bentley, again, you're talking about a, a criminally convicted homosexual pedophile was in prison for molesting a seven-year-old claimed to become a Christian, had himself covered with tattoos, he was kicking the old ladies in the face, night after night, night after night, he was preaching, the Lord showed me there's a thousand people here going to give a thousand dollars. He was raking in, and he was getting the money, sometimes raking in over a million a night, it would appear. Well, the whole time this was going on, he was being unfaithful to his wife and this guy was being trumpeted um, by, by Rick Joyner and by C. Peter Wagner they were, they were cheering this guy as a hero well after they prophesied over him that he was going to lead the great revival four days later he abandons his wife and three children and takes off with this other woman divorces his wife and marries her now they're trying to bring him back into ministry Rick Joyner is trying to rehabilitate. He's with another woman. When you see a thief, you're pleased with him. And you associate with adulterers. He's an adulterer. He's, <laughs> the Lord showed me there's a thousand people going to give it this. He takes the money and God did. They're pleased with him. And that's only a contemporary example. There are many examples of this. When they see a thief, they're pleased with them. In other words, they're getting clipped already. They're getting clipped already. Look with me, please, to Hosea chapter 7. When I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is uncovered, and the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief enters in, bandits raid outside. They do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their deeds are all around them. They are before my face. With their wickedness they make the king glad, and the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers, like an oven heated by the baker who ceases to stir up the fire, from the kneading of the dough until it is leavened, leaven being a figure, of course, of sin and false doctrine. Now look at this. These people are adulterers and they're thieves. But the king and the princes are happy about their lies. They make the king glad and the princes with their lies. Why will you see major pastors and figures lending credence to these con artists? They make them happy with their lies. They make them happy with their thievery. This brought about 
the Assyrian captivity of the ten northern tribes. This brought God's judgment on the ten northern tribes. And it's bringing God's judgment on the contemporary church. What does it say in Romans 11? If he didn't spare the natural branches, he won't spare you either. If Israel and the Jews could not get away with this kind of activity, either will the church. But they're doing it. They're doing it. They're actually doing it. Can you imagine? He leaves his wife and children and they're trying to bring him back. It means nothing. It means nothing to them. Money talks. They don't care about the adultery. Look with me, please, to Isaiah 123. Your rulers are rebels and companions of thieves. <laughs> Your leaders are in rebellion against God. They're companions with thieves. It's shocking. Shocking. I couldn't believe some of the things that have happened. Again, when something is in the public domain and you cite it, you're not throwing mud. You're simply stating facts. You know, when Oral Roberts said a 900-foot-tall Jesus Christ appeared to him and said if he doesn't cough up six and a half million, by the end of the month he's going to kill him. And people like Jack Hayford defended him. Somebody gave him the money to save the hospital, but the hospital wound up closing down anyway, and Jesus didn't kill him. And he was on TV crying, please, he's going to kill me. He says that Jesus Christ is... is there's a 900-foot-tall Jesus Christ who's running a protection racket. <laughs> that's what he was saying. In effect, that's what he was saying. He's going to knock me off if I don't cough it up. Please help him. That's what he was saying. That's what gangsters do. That's what the mafia does. And there was pastors defending him. Your rulers are rebels. They're companions with thieves. Jesus warns his father's house became a den of thieves. There it is a different word for thieves. It's not kleptos. A kleptos is the one who harpezos. These are swindlers in, 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 in Luke 19, 46. You've made my father's house a den of thieves. Well, that's how the devil does it. That's how the devil kleptos. That's how he steals. That's how he destroys. That's how he kleptos. That's what he does. Jesus is coming in the character of the enemy to do the same thing the enemy does with an entirely different motive. He comes like a kleptos. To understand what Jesus is going to do, we have to understand what the enemy does. Quite a thing. The kleptos is always the enemy. But he comes like a kleptos. Now let's look at the other side. Remember, every time this word harpezo occurs, it teaches something about the rapture. Look with me, please, to Acts 23.10. And a great dissension was developing. The commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them and ordered the troops to go down and harpezo him, rapture him, seize him away by force. Same word in Greek. To take him away from them by force and bring him to the barracks. But on the night immediately following, the Lord stood at his side. That is the peshet, the straightforward meaning Paul was going to be seized, they were going to rip him in half, literally. They are going to tear him to pieces. And so the <coughs> Roman Shylock dispatches his soldiers to rescue Paul before they could rip him to bits. He has Paul harpezoed. 
Notice he has Paul harpezoed before the mob could harpezo him. Do you see that? <coughs> this is a picture of the rapture. The Antichrist is going to try to rip the body to pieces. When the eagles gather, the corpse will be also. But before that can happen, our commander is going to send his angels to gather his elect. Amen. He will harpezo us before the enemy can. Every time you see that word, it teaches something about the rapture. The word rapture is over and over and over. Every time, our commander is going to have us snatched away before the enemies can snatch us away and rip us to pieces. There will be a rescue. Now, let's go back, please, just for a moment, once again to Matthew chapter 24. The other discourse to verse 43. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert, would not have allowed the house to be broken into. And also Daniel chapter 12. Verse 1, Now at that time Michael the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time your people, everyone who was found written in the book will be rescued. We'll be talking about this tomorrow, okay? It has to do with Iran and Persia and so forth. But notice those whose names are in the book will be rescued. There's a rescue coming. This rescues the rapture. Now, in England we have Gerald Coates. In this country you have Rick Joyner. You have people who teach against the doctrine of the rapture, saying there is no rescue. Well, how are you going to get rescued if you don't believe there is a rescue? But let's look again at Matthew 24. Jesus gives a list of signs to look out for. And he says, I'm coming like a thief in the night. Look out for these signs. This will tell you it's getting closer. If you knew what time he was coming, you would not have allowed your house to be broke into. Well, I'm coming just like that burglar. We're told by Paul, that day should not overtake us like a kleptos. It's the world who's to be taken by surprise. It's the apostate church who's to be taken by surprise, not the faithful bride. But let's understand this. Watch out for these signs. Verse 42, be alert. You don't know which day he's coming, but he's, be sure of this, he's coming like a thief in the night. Watch out for these signs. Suppose you were going to go drive down from here in the Midwest and take your children or your grandchildren to Orlando, to Disney, Disney World. Well, okay, you're going to do that. And somebody says to you, don't bother to turn on the burglar alarm. <laughs> How long are you going to be gone? Three weeks? Oh, and don't bother to put on the burglar alarm. Don't bother to check the windows. Don't bother, you know, to tell the next door neighbor you're going to be away. Keep an eye on, on, on your property. Don't, don't you know, what, what, are you going to leave a crime light on? What do you want to do that for? Waste electricity. What, you, you're going to leave a, a television or radio switched on so they think somebody's home? Don't, 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 let's, leave the door open. Turn off the lights, get in the car, drive to Florida, and have a good time. Who's going to do that? Who's going to believe somebody who tells you that? Well, I'm only stating a fact. You go on his website, Rick Warren, Saddlebrook Church, The Purpose Driven Lie. Avoid end time prophecy, it's a diversion. Jesus says, look out for this stuff. Watch out for this. I'm coming like a thief. Be alert. Watch for this stuff. No, no, no. You didn't, you didn't. Who cares what Jesus Christ said if you have Rick Warren? Who needs the New Testament if you have the purpose-driven lie? This is literally and exactly what he says on his website. 
Jesus commands, commands we be alert and watch for these things. No, 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 no. You understand who he works for? He works for the thief. He works for the burglar. He doesn't work for the Lord, he works for the burglar. I mean, this is not a mistake. This is blatant. Jesus said to do one thing, he actually teaches people to do the other. Blatantly. It's unbelievable, but that's what's happening. Look at 2 Corinthians, please, chapter 12. Verses 2 to 4. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I don't know or out of the body I don't know, God knows, such a man was harpezoed, raptured to the third heaven. Same word. Now, we talked about this on the Thanatology tapes. He didn't know if he was in the body or out of the body. When we're raptured, we won't know if we're dead or if we're dead. We'll just know we're alive. That's it. We'll know we're alive in Christ. But <laughs> we won't know if we're in the body or out of the body. We won't know if we're dead. We'll just know we're alive. That's all we'll know. Okay. To the third heaven. The Greeks had three con a concept of three heavens. The first was the atmosphere of the earth. The second is outer space. And the third is eternity. As I've explained this before, but I'll go through it quickly for the tape. We have two Greek words, of course, for time, chronos and kairos. Kairos is the clock, but eternity is not a clock that keeps going. Eternity is no clock at all. <laughs> okay? Yet there is an eternity, chronos. We get the word chronology. There's an order of events, but they take place out of time. For instance, in the book of Revelation, the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. You know, and John says, and then I saw, and then I saw, but he speaks of future events in the past tense and past events in the present tense. There's no kairos, there's just chronos. There's an order of events that take place out of time. Time depends on the second heaven, on outer space. In other words, time depends on planetary motion. Kairos depends on planetary motion. Strictly speaking, there is a clock, an atomic clock, that works by particle emissions. It doesn't work by planetary motion, but it still has to be calibrated in nanoseconds. It still has to express its measurements by planetary motion. There's no other way to express it, okay? So even the one kind of clock we have that doesn't work by planetary motion still has to be calibrated in terms of, of cal planetary motion. Time depends on planetary motion. So you read in Revelation and Zechariah, the Shemaim, or Uranus in Greek, is rolled up. Eternity meets earth. Time, time and space meet, meet heaven because the second heaven is rolled up, okay? So Paul goes up to the third one, okay? And he says in verse 3, I know how such a man, whether in body or apart from the body, I don't know, God knows. Notice he says that twice. That's why he says it's a mystery. We shall be changed, but he didn't even understand that what had happened to him. He was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not p permitted to speak. Paul was raptured. Well, he was harpezoed. That's, you know, he was caught up. He was harpezoed. That teaches about what's it going to be like to be raptured. Well, that's what's going to be like to be raptured. You won't know if you're dead, you just know you're alive. You won't know if you're in the body or out of the body, but... You just, that's what it's like to be raptured. It tells you. Every time that word is there, it tells us something about it. Look at Acts chapter 8, please. The 8th chapter of Acts where the word occurs again. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord harpezoed Philip away, raptured him away. And the eunuch saw him no more, but he went on his way rejoicing, and Philip found himself at Azotus. Notice when Paul was harpezoed, you see him again back on earth. 
When Philip is harpezoed, you see him back on earth. When Paul is harpezoed, you see him back on earth. There is a millennial reign of Christ. Every time you see somebody harpezoed, you see them coming back to earth. <laughs> it's not a one-way ticket. It's a return ticket. Only, of course, it'll be the earth as it was before the fall of man. It will not be the world. It'll be the earth. Every time it happens. Always remember, if you see somebody, you have six months to live. No, you have 1,000 years plus six months to live. <laughs> believers go to sleep, and then they wake up again. Death is for unsaved people. You know, believers go to sleep. Believers don't die. They simply go to sleep. Death is for unsaved people, not for believers. I don't care if you have six months to live or whatever. I almost snuffed it in Africa in June. Despite the prayers of many people, the Lord preserved my days. <laughs> Even if I snuffed it, I'd still have a thousand years to go. Well, that's the way it is. You always see when somebody's heart pays, or you always see them back incarnate on the earth somewhere. Well, let's continue. Um, Acts 8.39, he's harpezoed, he's, he's snatched away. And then you see him back again. They don't see him anymore. Same as Enoch, and he was no more. Let's look, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Thessalonians 4.17, the word happens again. Then we who are alive and remain shall be harpezoed together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort each other with these words. People, I've heard people say, the word rapture is not in the Bible. <laughs> what do you want to say, harpezo? <laughs> Okay, harpezo. The word harpezo is many places in the Bible. And every time it occurs, it teaches something about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Every time it occurs, it's a reference to 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Every time. Look at, at Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, please. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was harpezoed to God and to his throne. Now, as we've explained before, this is a pressure interpretation of the nativity narrative. Herod wanted to kill Jesus coming out of Mary. Jesus, by divine intervention, was rescued. And then Herod comes and kills the other babies and so we see here the dragon was enraged with the woman and makes war with the woman and the rest of her offspring in verse 17. It is a pressure interpretation of, of Christmas story if you want to call it that. Okay. Well, it's a future event however because Jesus was taken to Egypt. Here the man-child is harpezoed to God and to his throne. Okay. Well, there's going to be a harpezo. There's going to be our. It's always a rescue. The context of Paul, it's a rescue. <laughs> Before the dragon could could snatch the kid away, God snatches the baby away. Before the mob could snatch Paul away, God arranges providentially for the chillock to snatch Paul away. Okay. It's always a rescue context. It's always a context of a rescue. Now, if you don't believe there's a rescue, how are you going to get rescued? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 2 and verse 4. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a kleptos in the night. Remember, the day of the Lord is inaugurated by the Episunagage. When the church is removed, 
God pours out his wrath on the kingdom of Antichrist. This is the day of the Lord. But it comes suddenly. Had those days not been cut short, another term for rapture, as it were, or at least it's synonymous in its use for rapture, I should say, is this word. The Kolobo. The amputation. Had those days not been cut short. If you have a highly metastatic cancer in an extremity or in an organ, and it's highly metastatic, it, it, its metastasis cannot be retarded by isotope therapy or by chemo, you've got to have a surgical excision before it can spread to other organs. Or if it's uh, cancer in, it's, or gangrene in an extremity, you have to amputate to prevent the entire body from dying. Well, that's what's going to happen. The bad parts of the body of Christ are going to be... <laughs> He's going to take it out of here. There'll be an amputation. It will be cut short before the body dies. When the shattering of the power of the holy people happens, the suffering of the faithful church is going to be cut short. The faithful church will not experience the wrath of God, but it will experience persecution. But that persecution will be cut short by an amputation, the colobo. Okay? Just <laughs> Global is an important word in eschatology. Well, let's continue looking at this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verses uh, 2 and 4. It doesn't just say it will come like a thief, just like a thief. How does the devil operate? That's what Jesus is going to do. When you don't expect it. <laughs> yeah. Just like my friend back in England. They don't have a clue they're going to get robbed. And they don't have a clue how he's going to do it. They don't even have a clue when he's going to do it. He might hack into their system at 2.30 in the morning. When the, everything is closed but the system is running. He may hack into their system by remote from another computer in Asia or Africa. They wouldn't have a clue. Just like a thief, it's emphatic. Now look at verse 4. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day should overtake you like a thief. It should not overtake us like a thief. I'm frightened when people are ignoring end time prophecy or are being taught to avoid it by Rick Warren and his henchmen. Let's go further with this. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. There it is again, like the kleptos, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be dissolve with fire and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up and as I think I've explained before that word for element in Greek is stoichia where you get stoichiometry you know elemental chemistry the periodic chart of the elements gram atomic weight atomic number things like that well the Greeks knew about elements but they didn't know about subatomic particles or subatomic physics they didn't know about neutrinos or positrons or electrons or neutrons or protons they just had an idea about elements and they had a word atom, atmos, which meant that which is indivisible. They didn't know you could go any smaller than an, than an atom elementally. That was the smallest to them. In fact, it wasn't until the 20th century that people knew you could dissolve an atom. But this fisherman from Galilee said, not only can you dissolve an atom, but you can destroy the biosphere by doing it. Wow. This was long before people knew about the critical mass of plutonium or cobalt or uranium-238 or rich uranium. It's amazing, but that's, a, that's literally and exactly what it says in, in, in Greek. It's literally exactly what it says. That you can dissolve an, an element, that which was indivisible, with enough explosive energy to destroy the biosphere. It'll come sudden. 
You think of a man in North Korea, out of his mind, and another one in Iran, out of his mind. Both of those regimes supply terrorist organizations. What's going to stop them from passing on these weapons to some terrorist organization? And when the thing goes off in Chicago or Paris or something, they'll say, we had, we had nothing to do with it. We, <laughs> we and you know, and you'll have the president saying Islam's a religion of peace or something, you know. <laughs> you know, corrupt leaders, godless men. <laughs> That's what you've got. Like a thief. Look with me, please, <coughs> to Zechariah chapter 5, verse 4. Flying scroll. Verse 4 I will make it go forth, declares the Lord of hosts, and it will enter the house of the thief, and the house of the one who swears falsely by my name, and it will spend the night within that house and consume it with its timber and its stones. Notice <coughs> the flying scroll, Megillah in Hebrew. It goes into the house of the thief. And we'll leave that house in ruins. How many people here used to be in crazy churches that were teaching seriously false doctrine and the Lord got you out of it by his spirit through showing you what the scriptures meant? How many people in a church like that? Look around. <laughs> what happened? The scroll flew in, you understand? The scroll went into the house of the thief. There are people who through no fault of their own, they're in these loony churches that are preaching money and ecumenism and God knows what else, they don't know any better. It's all they were ever told. I was saved in a cult called the children of God. You wouldn't believe the things that I believed when I first met You wouldn't believe that anybody could believe. It's all I knew. It's all I knew. It was, it was crazy, but I didn't know it was crazy. It's all I knew. There are people in these places who just don't know any better. There are brethren. They're in ignorance. I was in ignorance. You were in ignorance. But the scroll goes in to the house of the thief. And of course, we know now that Robert Schuller's Crystal Cathedral is 55 million in debt. 55 million. He's the granddaddy of most of this, this junk you see happening in Chicago and Saddlebrook. And he, he was the first one with the with the motivational psychology and the positive thinking and all this stuff calling itself Christian. He was the granddaddy of it. Now they're going down the tubes fast. They don't know if they can even save, salvage anything. It's, it's so far in debt. Well, let's look. Look at Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, please. Remember, therefore, what you've received and heard, and kept it and repent. Now, Sardis comes from the Greek word sarx of the flesh. It was a church who heard the truth. These were Christians who knew the truth at one point. Repent. If, therefore, you will not wake up, I'll come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. These were people who used to know the truth, and he's warning them, wake up, remember what you heard. There were churches who at one time stood squarely and solidly on biblical truth. At one time, not that many years ago, you would have been hard pressed to find a Baptist church that was not biblical. You would have been hard pressed to find the Pentecostal church that was not biblical. And I'm talking only 30 years ago. Now, they heard the truth, they heard the truth, but they're not ready for the coming robbery. Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. He keeps saying it over and over and over. I'm coming like a thief.
You see, the people who are caught up in this lunacy with the tele-evangelists and things like that, they're being robbed already. They are being robbed already. I know people, I know Christian businessmen who've been, who've been taken to the cleaners by religious con artists. They're being robbed already. They're being, what Ezekiel said, <coughs> fleecing the sheep. I don't mean giving, money, mean giving money to missions or to honest ministries or things like that or to Christian charity. I mean these, these are con artists. They're fleecing the sheep. They're being robbed already. Well, there's a bigger robbery coming. Again, if you can't see to an obvious false prophet, what's going to happen when the false prophet comes? If you can't see through a petty thief, cum tele evangelist, what's going to happen when the real crook shows up? Quite a thing. Jesus is coming like a thief. He's going to rob the thief. He's going to do exactly what my friend in England does. He's going to behave just like a thief. He's going to do exactly what a thief does before the thief does it. But everybody is going to get harpezoed. Everybody is going to get ripped off. Everybody is going to be snatched away. The only question is, who is going to do it? The kleptos comes to Harpezo in order to kill. The one who is like a kleptos comes to Harpezo in order to save. The kleptos comes to Harpezo in order to destroy. The one who is like a kleptos comes to Harpezo <coughs> in order to rescue. The kleptos comes to Harpezo what is not his. The one who was like a Harpezo comes to kleptos those who are his, bought by his own blood. The kleptos comes to Harpezo in order to bring death. The one who was like a Harpezo, a kleptos, comes to Harpezo in order to bring life. The kleptos comes to Harpezo in order to steal. The one who is like a kleptos comes to Harpezo in order to restore. One way or another, everybody gets Harpezoed. You're going to be Harpezoed, I'm going to be Harpezoed. Your family's going to be Harpezoed, my family's going to be Harpezoed. This church here in the American Midwest is going to be Harpezoed. My church in England is going to be Harpezoed. We all get Harpezoed. The only question is, who is going to do it? You have no choice about being Harpezoed. You're going to get Harpezoed. We're all going to get Harpezoed. We have no choice. What we can choose is, who do we want to do it? <laughs> That's the choice. Either the kleptos or the one who was like a kleptos. That day should not overtake us like a kleptos. That day should not overtake us like a thief. God bless. See you tomorrow.